they may be similar. Like and what I suddenly realized after you know, actually some period of time was um, he didn't really want to know why it was aggressive. He wanted to stop being aggressive. And so he wanted some help, and it really doesn't do him a lot of good for me to write some paper that he was never going to see in some obscure journal somewhere. So what uh, I did over the years is I kind of altered my um, approach until I ultimately developed a clinic, a multidisciplinary clinic. And now everyone we see is a patient, and they do get treatment, and they do get better. Uh, and I think that's one of the things you're going to see today. Uh, in doing that, what we had to do was spend a good part of that 10 years developing a classification scheme for violence. Uh, because one of the goals today is to show you that violence is not violence, not violence. I mean, one guy comes in and he committed a murder. Another guy comes in and he committed a murder. Totally different, given the context of what happened. Some might be treated, some it's difficult to treat. And so I'm going to go through that and, and uh, kind of show you that. So as far as an overview goes of what we're going to kind of hope to accomplish, for the first half, I'm going to talk about classification and assessment. Um, and then I'm going to show you a brief video uh, to introduce you to uh, Alfred Jones, who was Arthur Jones, actually. Arthur Jones, who was a patient of mine, uh, in a little news piece that was done on him after he went through the study and had some significant change. And then we'll talk about him. And then uh, we'll talk about psychophysiology and treatment. I do use a lot of psychophysiology. I was trained as a psychophysiologist, actually, so I put that in. And we're also going to talk about neuropsychology and a lot of personality assessment also. And then finally, I'd like to have a, a question and discussion time where you might ask me questions or perhaps you even have violent patients that you've seen and, and you might have something to add in that. Um, almost anyone in practice is going to come across violent patients, uh, no matter what it is that you do. Most people don't want to see them. Uh, in fact, I'll even talk about some psychiatrists who send me their violent patients because they don't want them anymore, and they ask me not to send them back. So uh, it's the difficult patient to deal with. All right, well, let's start talking about classification and assessment. If everyone, hopefully everybody got a handout, and we're going to go through that in a few minutes. And what that handout is is it's a procedures manual for a set of, of procedures that we've developed over the years to assess aggression. Uh, and we're... Uh, we're talking about the aggressive act itself, not the individual, you know, so because different aggressive acts fall into different categories. But when you're talking about anything, you have to define it first. And you're going to have some considerations. Now, this is where a lot of times people, you know, really question me and they say, well, you know, or in the literature, you look in the literature and you find there's lots of definitions of aggression. And honestly, most of them don't really help. We're certainly not a clinician. Because a person tries to sit down and they try to kind of philosophically define aggression in the context of you yelling at your friend all the way to some global conflict. And they try to come up with a definition that's going to encompass all of that. Well, the problem with that is that that doesn't really mean a whole lot to the guy who showed up at your office who needs help with the fact that maybe he's beating on his wife and getting into fights at work. Because, you know, he doesn't really care about what's going on in the Congo or something like that. It doesn't really mean, and, and that definition may not help him, okay? So it's not that that's not a useful definition for something else, but for him it's not. So uh, other considerations that we have are, you know, verbal versus physical aggression. You know, a lot of people have verbal outbursts. They yell at people, scream at people, but they're never physical, okay? Well, is there a difference there? Um, hostility versus threat. Some people are very angry all the time. They're very hostile. They kind of keep it inside. Those are the people that are boiling versus other people who use threat as a, to their advantage. They bully people, they puff up their chest and make people afraid of them, but they never injure anyone or they never strike anybody. Where does that fit into the whole thing? Also property versus people, which is something we looked at early on. If I say someone's physically aggressive, people don't traditionally think about that meaning that you throw things and break things or hit the wall or slam doors, things like that, or drive your car into other cars or things like that. They think about you hitting someone was there a difference between someone who says, say when they get upset, they punch the wall and put a hole in their wall, as opposed to they punch their coworker? And uh, we've looked at that, and we actually find that those people tend to be very similar. Because you have to remember, everybody that comes in who's aggressive, even if they tell you they're aggressive, they're, they never tell you they're as aggressive as they really are. They always minimize to some extent. So what we came up with was this definition, and we may be cheating a little bit because we went for physical aggression. Everyone I'll talk about today and all the data I'll show you today are from physically aggressive people. And we define it as a behavioral display in which physical force is used with the intent, and that's in parentheses, and I'll talk about that in a moment, uh, 
to harm or damage another individual or object. So you throw things, you break things. I've had innumerable people come, men come to me. I would also be data on women today. I have just as lots of violent women. They're just as violent uh, when you use this definition. And uh, you know, they come because they are tired of replacing the sheetrock in their house. You know, and they'll bring pictures. They have 30 holes. They've got 37 holes in the walls in his apartment. Uh, that's a lot of holes. You know, but you know he also throws dishes and breaks things up and like that. So this is our this is our definition. So everyone you see today is going to be physically violent, okay, including the females. And just to answer your question that you're already thinking, we don't have as many females, but they're just as violent. In fact, in most instances, more violent than the men, because for a female to be physically violent, just be fairly disinhibited. Um, and I'll tell you about the most violent person I ever met, who is a 4'11", 21 year old female. She is the most violent person I've ever met. Now, let's talk about forms of aggression, because this is where we're going to work our way towards this uh, procedures manual that, I, that I've given you. Um, if you look in the animal literature, and there is a lot of data on aggression in animals. Okay? I was originally trained using animals, not in aggression, but in another field. But I was trained to use animals and to be respective of that word. But I will have to say, and people get mad at me, I don't think the animal literature has done anything for aggression other than perhaps give us a few areas in the brain to look at, but they don't even pan out in humans. Uh, and so you, know, you can do lesions in animals in certain areas and then find a human with the same lesion, and they don't, certainly don't show the same kind of aggression that an animal does. Also, aggression in animals is not abnormal. Animals have to be aggressive. But aggression in a human isn't abnormal either. We're going to talk about that. And I had a great intro by Bob earlier when he talked about the concept of control, because that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about control here, not really being aggressive, and you'll see that as we go through. But if you do look at the animal literature, you find two types of aggression tend to be mentioned over and over, and that's predatory aggression and some type of affective or defensive aggression, an aggression that's generated by some kind of agitated state. You shock the animal and get them agitated, and then they attack the other individual. And the, probably the most common uh, model of aggression in animals right now is called, it's called a resident intruder. You isolate a male rat for some period of time in his cage. He deems that his territory. Then you introduce a novel male. And they'll kind of have a fight display. And you know, he'll attack the one that's in, it's the intruder that's coming to his, his area. That, then he becomes agitated. He's trying to defend his area. Okay? And you can physiologically see that in the animal. You can take cortisol measures, all types of things. You can see they're agitated. Predatory aggression is like the hawk eats the rat. You know, or like you put one of the classic aggression models for eons, even when I was in graduate school, was muricide, which is you put a rat in a box and you drop a mouse in with him, and the rat will kill the mouse. And they always kill the mouse exactly the same. They bite him on the back of the neck and break his neck. Now, you have to starve the rat to get them to eat the mouse. They don't kill the mouse to eat them. They kill them because mice eat the same food that rats do. They're both territorial. If there's a mouse in my territory, I don't want to eat my food. So they kill the rat, throw it off to the side, and they just they leave it there. Now, no agitated state. There's no physiological arousal in the animal. It's just stereotype behavior. Every rat kills every mouse the same way. Okay, So that's predatory aggression. Now, the only problem is those two types of aggression don't very well map over onto humans. Now, maybe the effective defense, and I'm going to talk about that in a second, but there really isn't real predatory aggression in humans. Now, we're going to talk about premeditated aggression, and someone always brings up hunting, which perhaps is predatory in nature. But in the context of clinical aggression, and that's where we're going to kind of look at it, these, this really isn't all that useful to us. But let's look in the human literature, and we find this, there's a lot more names than this, but there's all kind of names. Every aggression researcher has made up their own names for the types of aggression they see. But you do see basically two types. You see some kind of a planned aggression, premeditated, instrumental, predatory, some people use that term, proactive. They know what they're doing. It's planned out. It's controlled. There's no agitated state that goes along with it. They do what they do on purpose, and they tend to want to get away with it. So they cover it up, or they're careful how they do it. Okay, It's used in a goal-oriented manner. Okay, You have something I want, or I want you to do something that I want, and so I'm violent towards you. Okay. Or an impulsive aggression, impulsive, hostile, effective, reactive. That's, this is the explosive aggression. This is rage. This is what we hear about on the news every night that you, know, you hear about it most often. Road rage, air rage, any kind of rage. The person loses control. They're you know, 
quote unquote normal, then they lose control, they're violent, it's excessive, it's beyond what the stressor was, and then suddenly it's over, they're remorseful, they wish it had never happened, and they go on with their life, and they may do it again, but it's, it's intermittent, they, are, they lose control, it's, they're, quote, quite often it's referred to as Jekyll and Hyde, I hear that constantly from the guys, I'm two people, I'm the guy there by nose, and then I'm this guy that I lose control and I hit people or I break things, okay? So again, you see two types, and you can see they're, they're similar to the animal, but, you know, if I give medication to an animal, am I gonna be able to stop his predatory aggression or some treatment to an animal? Probably not, so this probably isn't the same thing as this. And the effective defense, again, if I give, if I give medication, and muricide was often used as a measure of medication treatment, give medication to the rat, if he stops killing the mouse, well, that must be an anti-aggressive agent. I mean, I don't know. That doesn't seem to be a really effective test. Same thing here. I mean, if I stop a rat from being, from which is a classic territorial animal, from being territorial by giving it some medication, does that really mean that if I give that medication to somebody who's explosively violent that they're not going to be, again, it doesn't seem to, to go off. It's not a one-to-one -one type of relationship. But then we look in the clinical literature when people just looked at humans and we see a problem there also and that is if you look at the DSM okay which is our diagnostics manual and we want to go by that we do find one disorder that is is 100% aggressive in nature okay that's intermittent explosive disorder it's an axis one disorder major mental illness okay the only problem with it is you almost can never have it okay if you have any other disorder of which aggression could possibly be a symptom which is basically any other mental illness, period, or a personality disorder, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, you can't have IED. Because classically in psychology and psychiatry, aggression is a symptom of some other disorder. If you treat the disorder, the aggression will go away. But the only problem with that is virtually everyone I see does not have a disorder. They may have a personality disorder, and we'll talk about that, but they're aggressive. So, uh, you know, I've, I've made quite a career at this point off of the fact that HMOs will not pay for, you know, any type of intervention unless you have an Axis I disorder a lot of times. And so these guys show up at clinics. They're aggressive. They're not bipolar. They're not depressed. They're not psychotic. They're, they're nothing. And they get sent to me because they have nowhere to send them. And we do everything for free. So, you know, we, we have more people than we know what to do with. So intermittent explosive disorder, there's a little bit of a problem with that. Um, every once in a while you find somebody meets the criteria. But it's a classic explosive kind of behavior. It's supposed to be rare, and it happens very intermittently. It's not something that would happen every week, but happen very intermittently. Antisocial and, say, borderline personality disorder. These are what you think of as classic. If somebody shows up and they're violent, you just start thinking, well, that must be what's wrong with them. Specifically, if they're a female, you're thinking they're borderline. If they're, anti they're male or antisocial. Although you find a lot of borderline symptoms in the males also. Okay, so they have a personality disorder. Well, I mean, that, that's kind of, you know, in the, okay, they have personality disorder. Well, there's nothing you can do for them, which is kind of the classic idea in psychology and psychiatry. Well, you know, this, you can maybe, you know, if, if you come from a psychoanalytic perspective, maybe there's some long term insight oriented therapy you can do and things like that, but they're really the worst possible patient. I mean, a violent, borderline female is the last thing you ever want to see walking in the door. They're just a terrible patient. So typically, there's nothing done to these people. Um, and then again, as I said, it's a symptom of virtually every disorder. I mean, you, we can just go through it. Uh, and, and I've seen it time and time again. A person gets sent to me, they've been treated for all different kind of things, even things you would not classically think of as aggression being a symptom. And if I can get a hold of their chart, that's what was written down by the psychiatrist, or that was what was written down by the psychologist. And normally, they actually don't even meet criteria for that. They just were close, particularly borderline, which is a very, very classic thing I see. The person must be borderline because they're depressed. They have a very uh, low mood. They're sad. And they must have these mood swings because they're becoming agitated and violent. Well, the thing is, is most of the people I see are sad because society has rejected them because they're violent. They're not depressed because and that makes them aggressive, they're depressed because they're aggressive. And they're not necessarily having mood swings, they're losing control of their aggressive impulses. You know, other than that, they're not really having a problem with that. So, 
you know, they've taken lithium, they've taken you know, all types of things that have been really uh, ineffective for them. Most common thing these guys are on is some type of antidepressant, uh, usually an SSRI. And granted, there's some work that shows SSRIs might be effective for certain types of aggression, but most people I've seen they haven't been effective. They feel better, but they're still violent. So that's a question. Now, what clinical researchers did is they started to make up disorders to try to fill in the gap. And probably, you know, one of the classic ones is uh, Monroe's episodic discontrol, uh, discontrol syndrome, which is kind of this pervasive impulsive that just kind of overwhelms the person. The person's impulsive all the time, but they also have these outbursts. And that's from the 70s. But, you know, that never really caught on as a, you know, you can't really diagnose somebody with episodic discontrol syndrome. I mean, I've seen it done, but it's really not a classic disorder. Um, also, you know, psychotic trigger reaction, that's Annalise Pontius at Harvard. Uh, that's even more of a bizarre kind of a rare thing. These people have this explosive outburst that's linked to some type of early trauma, and they do, you know, just some terrible thing. Uh, the one that I most la the last one she looked at was a guy who basically took the organs out of his wife and hung her lungs up on a stake in the backyard because she had burned his, uh, his pasta. So uh, uh, don't do that. And so, uh, you know, and they found him way out in the woods with the rest, you know, it was really, it's really extreme. So, and then impulsive aggression is it's a term I typically use, but it's been used by Emil Kerr and Ernie Barrett, a lot of other people. Um, this kind of loss of control, explosive, but that's only one type of aggression. And then the kind of, what I kind of unfortunately see as the scourge of the aggression literature, not to say anything about the usefulness of, of the term, but the, the thing is, is that psychopathy does not mean you're violent. If you're a psychopath, you can fully meet the criteria, use a classic hair criteria, I'm here in British Columbia. So hair, classic psychopathy criteria, and you don't have to be violent to meet it. So what's happened in the aggression literature is that word is used interchangeably with aggression. And so what you have are a lot of theories about you know, emotional cues and arousal and things that all get mixed together with this idea of a person who, in essence, has no conscience or who is really cold and calculated with other types of aggression which, where someone may explode or something like that. So um, you can be aggressive and be a psychopath, but you don't have to be. So again, that's a little bit of a problem. So this has really done nothing for us. You know, so we have aggressive individuals and we really have nowhere to put them. Or if we do put them in a category like antisocial, we basically kind of discard them as if there's nothing we can do about it. And, um, you know, so that's where I come on the picture. You know, here I am, I'm this naive neuroscientist, and I'm, you know, I study aggression, but then I decide that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help everybody. You know, so, uh, you know, and that's what I do. So I get myself a clinician, because everybody needs one. And I get myself a neurologist. I got one of those two, a psychiatrist. And we make a team, and we get a clinic going, and that's, this is, these are the people we see. And this is where we get our violent people. Um, I'm going to show you data from incarcerated inmates today. If you want violent people, the best place to go is a prison. The only problem with that is people in prison have lots of other problems besides just being violent. They're in prison to begin with. That's a problem. So I would say that most of the aggression literature is done on incarcerated inmates or parolees, which we have some of those too. Um, but there's a real problem there. Lots of learning disability, low IQ, SES is all off. I mean, there's all kinds of problems there. Okay. Um, but it's, you know, they have a lot of time on their hands. And, and really, and they'll volunteer for anything. And if you want to watch their behavior, someone's watching them every minute of the day. So it's a nice place to go, but there's problems. Murder is not guilty by reason of insanity. I'll show you a little bit of data on that. We have a group of that. That's been very popular in the literature lately, particularly with the Andrea Yates and some of the other cases that you've seen. Um, but this is a real different case. These people are committing murder in a delusional state. You know, where does that fit in a greater scheme of aggression? Um, I told you probation, parole, individuals accused of domestic violence. As you see from these stars right here, these three groups right here, you can't really see it, they're all court ordered, okay? So this is where we start to kind of look at some specifics of what happens when somebody comes in and they're aggressive. People have different motivation when they come in to your clinic and they're aggressive. They may want to be there, which is great, which means they'll tell you virtually everything. They usually underestimate a little bit their aggression, but they'll tend to tell you just about everything. You know they're violent because they'll admit it to you. And you get a feel for how their violence goes. People that get sent to you 
and they don't want to be there. Okay, this group here wanted to see us. Okay, they have ongoing psychiatric illness, so they're very honest. This group does not want to see me. Okay, because I've been asked this group and this group. I've been asked one question: What is their potential for violence? Which is the worst question that anybody can ever ask you, because it. it that's an incredible responsibility. And they're not going to be honest. Because this guy right here, or girl, I see lots of females there too, they've never been violent in their life, ever. Even if you, I was telling Bob at lunch, even if you have police reports of their violence where that was witnessed by other individuals, they will deny that that ever happened and that that's some fraudulent piece of paper that was made up depending on how good their strategies are of trying to weasel through what they're going to do. So that's a real problem because what is the most common way that a violence is assessed in that context where you try to assess potential? Self-report measures, MMPIs, very common. Especially in the domestic violence literature, just they give that constantly. Or they give risk assessment measures where the person fills out. Well, if they're going to lie to my face, why wouldn't they lie on a piece of paper? It doesn't mean they have to be sophisticated, because surely there's lie scales on there. But if they lie and they give you an invalid MMPI, and now you're going to make, you're going to make a judgment on their violence by an invalid MMPI. So that's a real problem. So I'm going to show you a little bit of data on that. Clinic referred psych patients, they want to be there. They'll tell you a lot. Brain injured patients, they weren't, quote unquote, violent before their brain injury, and now they are. Well, what our data shows is that their tendencies and their personality was that of a person who would have those types of behaviors. And what's happened is the, the brain injuries just release that. But we know why they're like they are at that point. So that's a nice group to look at. Self-referred patients, we run a, I'm going to show you some clinical drug trials that we run. And we, uh, we run radio advertisements. Are you a man who has trouble controlling your temper? Do people call you hot-headed? Are you a short fuse? We have this, you know, it's a one minute commercial. I should have brought it, actually, I didn't think about that. Um, more people call than we can see, okay? I don't, and that's not just because we're in New Orleans, because I wasn't always in New Orleans. So. And then college students. Now, these are not, you know, in psychology, you know, 95% of all psychology theories based on college students, normal college students. These are physically violent college students, males and females. So this is not just like I went handed out some questionnaires and I got some normal people. These are all physically violent. In fact, and some of them have actually murdered. Okay, so it they're not your run they will show, and I'll show you, the same neuropsych profile, personality profile, and psychophysiology as this group right here, although their IQ is enormously different. This has nothing to do with IQ, SES, race, anything. When you classify the aggression correctly, and that's what I'm going to hopefully show you today. Now, back to the people lying. This is an MMPI profile, and this is Laura Helfritz, a student of mine. In fact, she's, there's another group we can add in here now. This was a, a small presentation she did, but these numbers have just about been tripled at this point. But uh, she's got another group in here. This is a group of men who have, we had documented act, that clear documents, documented proof that they were violent to their wives, okay, this is all men. And this is a group that we assessed and then after interviews with the wife also ultimately determined that this was a retaliatory statement that she made. She ultimately recanted or there was some evidence that this really never happened. Now that's hard to do. It takes you a long time to get that. And this is a smaller group we have, but, but ultimately we deem this group nonviolent. We also have a third group that I don't have on here, uh, which we deemed to have a high potential for violence even though we did not have clear documentation of the violence. And what you'll find, and if you know MMPIs at all, these people are lying, okay? This is, uh, you can see that they're under-reporting everything, in a sense. This is, these are invalid, all, all of them were invalid. Uh, this is lie scales, L, L, F, and K down here. Well, I show you that for this reason. The, you have to notice that the people that aren't violent, they're lying too, okay? They, they had nothing to worry about. All they needed to do was be truthful and everything. Remember why they're there. They want their children. So they're going to they're gonna manage their, the way that they show themselves to me. They want to look extra good. So when you compare this data to the norms for the MMPI2, what you find is they score, everyone scores the same, whether violent, not violent, or have a high potential for violence. They score the same as people who are looking for jobs. So that is, that's the data that they match up best with. 
Because when people are looking for jobs, they want to look their best. So what I can tell you, and it's no surprise, this is self-report measures are worthless for the assessment of aggression, except if you're using it to try to determine how much the person's lying. So we have a number of measures that we give that have lie scales and even some specific lie scales um, just to find out how much they're lying uh, that we kind of pepper throughout our day. We also spend from 9 o'clock in the morning until 4.30 in the afternoon with every individual. They're tested all day long. They get personality, they get neuropsych, and they get psychophysiology. Okay, it's a long day. The gentleman who did this before for the family service, which is the court order mediating group, um, he gave MMPI in a 15-minute interview. Okay, well, he charged him $80. He was doing them a favor by doing a, a low, you know, a low-cost thing for everybody. The problem is, is that I, I've never gotten a valid MMPI from one of these guys. They're all invalid. Every once in a while, I mean, I maybe had four or five out of 150 at this point over the last year. So, and, and that's not an exaggeration. That's that's the truth. So the problem is, is I'm, I'm certainly not going to predict somebody's uh, violence on this. So you have you, you have a difficult question when someone asks you, is someone going to be violent? It's different than why are people violent? You know, that's a research question. Okay, well, let's research that. Is a person going to be violent? Or, Doc, I'm violent, can you, can you treat me? Well, then at that point, you have to figure out what the underlying cause of their violence is. So what you notice very quickly when you sit down with violent people are all violence is not the same. Okay? Someone may come in and describe to you a cold, premeditated killing or attack, whereas another person describes what would best be described described as just a really ridiculous incident where they lost control or over, you know, overreacted to some really minor provocation and ultimately really hurt someone or killed them or did something really serious. Those are very different incidences. Uh, not to mention the fact that someone may kill in a delusional state. Remember I told you we had the group of not guilty by reason of insanity. You know, one gentleman shot his father. He was convinced his father was going to kill him. I mean, most of them were convinced that the person that they killed was going to kill them. And there's no doubt that they believe that. They really did. They're fully, all of our people are paranoid schizophrenic. It, it only makes sense. Now, when they're medicated and their paranoid schizophrenia symptoms are alleviated, they don't really pose all that much of a violence potential. But, you know, that's a little bit different question. So let's look here first. This is a classification, and this is part of what we're going to go over here, that the handout that you, that you got when you came in. This is what most people think of as aggression in psychiatry and psychology, and that's some kind of a secondary aggression. It's a symptom. And, and we, we define that a little bit different than it normally is. So we say a pattern of aggressive behavior due to the direct effects of diagnosal axis one, and we'll talk about that, psychiatric disorder, or the direct physiological effects of a substance or general medical condition. So let's get these bottom ones out of the way first. If you're a you know, heroin abuser, and you are a, you know, a cocaine abuser, and every time you get high or you're alcoholic, you beat up on people, you're a mean drunk. Well, if you stop drinking, chances are most of your aggression will, will go away. Now, maybe not all of it, but you know, maybe all of it and maybe not any of it. But in this instance, if we, made, if we you know, dried you out, detoxed you, got you some treatment, you stopped drinking, you stopped being aggressive. That's a secondary aggression. Here, general medical condition, you get shot in the head Okay, and now you have a frontal lobe injury, and now you're aggressive. Well, there's not a lot I'm going to be able to do about the fact that you got shot in the head. I might be able to put some structure around you, put you in a token economy, do, depending on what level of function you're at. But I know why you're aggressive. It's secondary to your head injury. What if you're schizophrenic? You're Andrea Yates, and you have to drown your children because you have to save them from their sins, in a sense, and send them to heaven. Okay? Um, you know, or, you know, things like that. So that's, if, if her psychosis is treated, she's probably not a major risk of violence. That's secondary aggression. And unfortunately, that's how almost all psychologists and psychiatrists tend to see aggression. Now, what happens if you don't have any of these, but you're violent? Well, th well we do have access to, which is kind of our junk, you know, we dump everything off on that. We still don't do anything with them. Okay, so they're antisocial. They have a character style that is antisocial. They're violent, they're irritable, they're angry, they are impulsive, they have. Okay, so we can't do anything with them. 
Well, I don't really see that as right. So what we would say in some instances, if someone comes to us and they don't have, they don't meet this criteria, but they have aggression, we would say that's a primary aggression, which means we mean that you can treat the aggression. You can focus on the aggression as a primary problem. And we see within that two types of aggression. And you're going to see very quickly that they are very different types of aggression. Pre predominantly premeditated, which means that the predominance of their aggressive acts are premeditated in nature. They're instrumental. They plan them out. They're conscious. They're not part of an agitated state. They want to do them, okay? And they want to get away with them, and they use it to their advantage. It, predominantly impulsive. A predominance of their aggressive acts are impulsive in nature. They're spontaneous or explosive. They lose control. It's a rage outburst. Okay, we hear all about it all the time, but they truly lose control. In many instances, they're remorseful afterwards. There's a clear agitated physiological kind of arousal that occurs before. It's almost like a release. Okay? Now, what you're going to see as we go through in a few minutes, and I'm just going to give you a little teaser, is that one of these has a very strong biological basis, and one of these does not. One of these has a very much social basis. Now, you've heard the controversy that tend to be studying the biological aspects of aggression. Well, if you just throw everybody together, which has been done most often in prison studies, you either find nothing or you, you start to make statements like, well, all aggression is biological, you know, because you just kind of clump it together. Most of the data has been equivocal until it's broken up, and not a lot of people are breaking it up. I mean, I'm not saying that our assessment's the end-all, be-all, but I, I would say that aggression clearly exist in at least two forms. And then I'm going to show you a little clinical data in a minute to kind of to back that up. So if you look at the handout that you have here, I just wanted to talk to you about this for a few minutes. This is a procedures manual that Ernie Barrett at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston and I had developed over the years. And what we did is we basically kind of took what we do when we go in and we interview these people and talk with them. And I'm going to show you a lot of assessment data in a minute. Um, and kind of put it down and then got some reliability data on it. Remember, you have different kinds of patients coming in. You have patients that are cooperative and ones that aren't cooperative, okay? You have patients that you're going to see for a long period of time. You have patients you're going to see for a few minutes. So you got to kind of work that into the whole scheme of things. So for a non-cooperative patient, you certainly don't want to sit there and ask them a bunch of questions and have them fill out a self-report. But what if you did a records review? You know, what if, if the person's violent, it's unlikely that you're seeing them the first time they've ever been violent. Okay. I mean, I deal with adults, you know, and if you're, you know, even if you're a 21-year-old male, it's unlikely this is your first violent incident that you've ever, you, you don't normally get sent to see me because you think you're going to become violent. You get sent to me because you've already been violent, and someone wants to know if you're going to be violent in the future. Well, guess what? You are. I don't even have to see you, because if you've been violent in the past, that's the best predictor of you being violent in the future. You don't really have to ask the question, does the person have a potential for violence? Of course they do. They've already been violent. I guess the real question is, is you're really asking, is it safe for me to let the person live in the community? Should I give the person their children? You know, those types of questions. And that's a little, that's a little bit different question there. But of course the person has a potential for violence. They've ever, violence never been violent. So we developed a records review, and you'll see that starts on page... Um, page four. And I, I want to just kind of make one note to this whole thing first. What's important is you're not classifying the person, you're classifying the act that they commit. So it takes a lot longer. You have to go through specific act after specific act. Okay. You don't, we're not, when I say someone's impulsive aggression, aggressive, I'm not saying that they're impulsive, like a personality characteristic. They are. But I'm saying that their violence is impulsive in nature, their acts that they commit. When I say someone's premeditatively violent, they're also impulsive, personality-wise, but their acts of aggression are planned out. So that's, very, that's a very important fact. You're not trying to describe the person, you're trying to describe their behavior. And what ultimately you get out of that is a pattern of how they act aggressively. So we developed a records review, and, and these are pretty standard questions. I mean, you basically would have thought of them yourself as you go through, but, you know, target was focus of a planned act, aggression was part of a secondary contingency plan. Like, for instance, you're going to rob a 7-Eleven, and you take a gun with you. Well, that gun doesn't have to have bullets in it if your excuse is, I just wanted to scare the person. If it has bullets in it, then you, were, you really believe that you would use it. 
There's no reason to put the bullets in to scare somebody. You just wave a gun in my face and I get a little scared. Now, I don't have to know that it has the bullets in it, okay? That means something. You know, that's a very common excuse that I get. Well, I just wanted to scare somebody with it. Okay, well, you didn't have to take the bullets. So, you know, that means something as you go through. You have to look for those type of things. Aggressor was influenced by group pre peer pressure, you know, the gang-related types of phenomena. These are all premeditated characteristics. You know, a person, you know, very common thing in the prison is that you attack uh, a rival ethnicity or something, particularly some of the prisons that we dealt with, you know, Hispanics attack African Americans and so forth. Well, the thing is, if you find out the individual's a member of a certain gang and he attacked a certain ethnic, I mean, you, you know, to begin with, that there's probably some premeditated aspect that is part of that. So you, you just go through the records, you, you get a number of instances out, and you can classify the individual. Now, we don't, what we recommend is you do as many of these procedures as you can. If you can do the records review and an interview and the behavior checklist, great. If you can just do two of the three or the four, then that's okay too. But you know, you try not to rely on a single one. And then in the back, what you're going to see is we have a, a lot of reliability and validity data. Uh, that's on uh, starts on page ten, no, nine, I think. And we have data on the records review. We have data on the interview. We took the records review, developed it into a semi-structured interview. We have uh, interrelated reliability on that. This is but in both this, all of this information has been done both in prison populations and in community samples and in psychiatric patients. So you'll see the reliability data in there, and also you'll you'll have a correlation matrix in the back that correlates the uh, behavior. I mean the self-report measure that we've developed with kind of known measures of anger and aggression. So what we've done is we've developed a, a records review. We've developed a semi-structured interview. We've developed a, what we call a quick screen, which is a quick behavioral checklist if you're only going to be with the person for a short period of time. All it does is assess whether the person's impulsively violent. It doesn't focus on premeditated at all. And then we've developed a self-report for a very cooperative patient where it will tell you, does the person do they say that most often they're, they're premeditated or planning their acts or they're explosive, okay? And it'll give you a feel for that. So all of these, except for the quick screen, tell you whether a person's predominantly impulsive or predominantly premeditated, okay? And it does take some time. You know, it's not something you can do in five minutes. Um, but I mean, you, you gotta think about what you're dealing with here. And, a lot, and I would say a lot of times, like I said, the person's not cooperative, so it's a little bit more difficult. Although, after you've done it, and we have a lot of reliability data there, and you can see it's very easy to do. It, you don't have to have a lot of training to do it. All of my graduate students can do this, and they do it very well, and our agreement is, is virtually 100%. You'll see that the agreements are in the high 90s, 97, 98%. That we, it, it's very easy. Once you know what to ask, and you know what to look for, and you're not trying to classify the individual, you're looking just at the act. Tell me about this act, describe this act to me. They'll tell you what they are. Oh, I lost it. Oh man, I, I, you know, I just, I'm like Jekyll and, I mean, they use the words for you. They don't have to, and P, they tend to not be sophisticated enough to try to, somebody's not gonna say, be predominantly premeditated and then try to make themselves look like they're explosive. I mean, they, there's not a strategy really there for that. They're going to try to look like they're not violent at all. But remember, they wouldn't be there if they weren't violent. Okay, that's a question. Now, it'd be different if you said, well, can you just bring somebody in here that's never been violent in their life and tell me if they're going to be violent? Well, some of the data I'm going to show you suggests that we might be able to make a guess. But what I'm talking about right now is dealing with known violent individuals and treating them. Because this is going to lead directly to treatment. Because what I'm going to show you is that the predominantly impulsive aggressive individual shows clear cognitive and psychophysiological deficits. Their brain does not function the same way that a nonviolent individual does. And that the premeditated individual is perfectly normal, except for their personality. And when you treat them with the same medications, which we've done, I'm going to show you some of that, these guys have a dramatic change in their behavior, and the other guys don't change at all. Okay, so, and so these people you see most often in the clinic. And in fact, I would, our data right now suggests that anywhere from 80 to 90% of the violent individuals that you see are explosively violent, okay? Because they have a real problem and they want to get help. I, I've rarely met an explosively violent person that said, I don't have any problem. 
because they know they have a problem. Society's rejecting them. They, they're losing their families, their jobs. You see very few of these in the clinic, okay? And, and that's because they don't have a problem. You have a problem, okay? You're not doing what they want you to do, so they have to keep hurting you. And so they use their aggression to their benefit. So, you know, out of 100 people, we might see 15 or 20 that would be this. And the only reason that they tend to come in is because they're trying to scam whoever it is they want to make think that they're going to change and not be violent anymore, which is usually a wife or a boyfriend or something like that. They're only there as a sham. They're not really there. Or they got sent to you because they were in prison. That's the thing. So I am going to show you some data that shows a little bit different aspect. But now, even within that, if we look just at uh, clinic patients, which are going to have just all kinds of disorders, people get sent to you for violence that have all kinds, and people that aren't even violent get sent to you. You know, it's just because, you know, he yelled at a nurse. I had this guy, poor guy, and he yelled at a nurse. He's violent. We had to send him over to you. He is out of control. I mean, the poor guy yelled at a nurse because one of his appointments was messed up. I mean, this is, he was one of the most passive individuals I've ever met in my life, okay? He was getting substance abuse treatment. And they, you know, he's violent and they, you know, marked him as this and all this kind of stuff. I had to write this huge long report to try to get him unmarked. But this is over about, over about a four year period. Here's 89 people that were sent to us specifically because they were violent, okay? And you see that. You know, 31 of them had an Axis one disorder, 50 of them had an Axis two, which only four of those were mental retardation. So most of them were personality disorders. You'd expect that. And, um, and then eight of them really didn't have any diagnosis at all. They really didn't even meet the criteria for IED. But then if we just look at the personality disorder, guys, you, we find what you'd expect, and that's most of them fall into cluster B, antisocial, borderline. The narcissistics are my favorite. They're the, you know, because they're very bright and grandiose and they know how to assess themselves better than you do. So as I was telling Bob at lunch, the, the, the saddest thing I see is that for some reason, narcissists attract the borderlines and marry them. And I see that all the time in my custody stuff. So uh, it's really a, not a pretty picture. But we have some, uh, you know, a couple of schizoids. And this is what was interesting to us, though. And that is, look at the high number of at least in this small sample, of obsessive compulsive disorder, which is not what you would initially think of as someone who's going to be violent. And then if you take it even, remember, this is a mix of premeditated and impulsive. If you take it further, and this is a group of men um, who were, um, you see, this is a group of men who just were put into an impulsive aggression study, a drug study. They've been weeded out for Axis one disorders and they're just explosively violent. They were weeded out over the phone and, and then we had these interviews with them. You see that all of a sudden we have, in essence, just as many obsessive compulsives as we have antisocials. And what we have tended to find is there's two types of impulsive aggressive individuals. There's both of them being born with some type of underlying disinhibition, and we'll talk about that. But they're born with this disinhibition, they're impulsive, they kind of lose control of their behavior. Not just aggressively, but just about everything. And they adopt one of two strategies. They either go, hey, that's how I am. I'm going to be impulsive. Now, that could be because of some social context. They could have parents who just really don't care, let them do whatever type of thing. But there's a lot of social influences here on both types of aggression. And then the other one adopts a very rigid style. They say, you know what, I'm going to set up boundaries for myself and be very rigid. And that's how I'm going to deal with this impulsiveness. And they begin to get rewarded for that. But it's ultimately a double-edged sword. So what you see is the guy who adopts the impulsive style becomes kind of the antisocial. The guy who adopts the rigid style becomes the obsessive compulsive, but the problem is, is as, they, as they, they do succeed and they get a little bit further in life, what happens is it starts to come back to them, because now they have these rigid boundaries that you can never possibly meet, and neither can they, and every time they go outside the lines, they lose it, they explode. So you, in essence, have almost an anxiety oriented impulsive aggression, and you have an impulsivity, I hate the, the term, but impulsivity oriented impulsive aggression. The interesting thing is they both can be treated the same way, and they show the same neuropsych and psychophysiological differences. Because it's a style they've adopted to try to deal with the way they, this underlying disinhibition they have. So this was really kind of a surprise for us, and we, we just recently have finished a review article that we're about to submit on this, and we have a lot of clinical data in there kind of showing that. So in essence, it's kind of a compensatory 
uh, response. And, and again, I'm not saying all obsessive compulsive people or obsessive compulsive personality disorder individuals um, are violent or have disinhibition. I'm just saying that a subset of them that are aggressive, we feel have adopted that in, in an attempt to deal with their disinhibition. So we're, we'll be submitting that or sometime this year. Now let's talk about the neuropsychology of uh, of um, of this. We, we do do personality, we do do neuropsychology. Uh, neuropsychologically, we give them a very long battery. And I didn't want to bore you with, uh, you know, putting up test after test of, you know, all the different kind of things that we do. But you, you can rest assured that the battery is mainly focused on executive function, but it also has a lot of scales that we know they'll do well on because we want to make sure that they don't have some other underlying brain dysfunction that we would miss, just we focus on executive function. But uh, what we find with the impulsive aggressive individual is indeed, like you'd expect, they cause executive function. And more specifically, with planning, impulse control, strategic processing, they couldn't come up with a strategy to figure something out if their life depended on it. I mean, even simple things like, you know, in, for instance, we use the FAS, which is the controlled oral word associated sense, you, you, you name as many words you can start with, start with F in a minute, go. You know, well, you know, believe it or not, there's a strategy to that. You don't really, it's not really conscious, but you can name words if you just kind of randomly start thinking of them, but you don't name nearly as many as if you start to try to name through. And, and Muriel Lezak talks about that in her book, and she's got a whole scoring scheme for that. Well, the impulsive guys, I mean, in a minute, they might come up with five words. They, they're just searching everywhere for a word. Whereas a person who isn't violent or impulsively violent, they, they use a strategy, like they go through the kitchen or they name off furniture or things like that. And so you can see these runs within there and we score it, you know, every so many seconds. They have like every 10 seconds or so. And so you can see these runs and they, and they do it very, very well. The same thing with uh, something like the Wisconsin card sorting task, which is, you know, kind of a broad measure of a lot of different functions. But, you know, they, they have, there's no, if you watch them try to sort these cards, it's, it's pitiful, you almost want to help them because they couldn't even form a strategy on how these things are supposed to go into stacks. It, it's really amazing. Uh, it, they're very bright people. They, have a, they can have a perfectly normal IQ, um, even, even a relatively high average IQ. It's just they can't form a strategy. They can't plan out ahead of time on anything. Um, and I'll, I'll show you some data on that a little bit. Um, so that's, that's really the, the trails, which is a, you know, something where you you'd go from A to 1 and you know, one to B, and you know, and you have to, it's kind of a set type of thing in there, and they, they can't do it for the life of them. One of the problems is that they keep making errors, like they keep lifting their pencil up, which you're not supposed to do, or they keep trying to, you know, fudge the rules on different tests, because they're impulsive, they want to get done. You, do them, you give them a maze task, don't go outside the lines. What's the first thing they do? They go outside the line. I mean, they try to cut the corner, and they're just really very impulsive, and they have real problems planning things. Now, they also have problems with verbal and there's a, a huge literature on one of the reasons that people are aggressive perhaps is because they have some underlying language dysfunction uh, or maybe temporal information processing problem that they can't sequence things. And so you find a lot of language problems, particularly in prisoners, obviously, which is a terrible group to look at. But I recently had a, a student publish her thesis where she looked at that. Our idea was that it's not language, it's just that language is an executive function or parts of it are, and if you, if you use test, it have a very low executive load where they don't have to s apply structure to it. Like for instance, if I just give you a word and you tell me what it means, or I show you a picture and you tell me, and I, give, and I show you it like in the Peabody, I show you four pictures and I tell you a word and you point to which one it is. That, that's, there's no structure you have to give me. But what if I show you a picture like uh, the cookie thief, which is this kind of bizarre picture, and then you have to tell me what's going on in the picture. You have to come up with your own verbal output. I don't give you any context. You just tell me what's going on. And then I score that for content and things, which there's clear schemes for that. They're done in speech pathology and linguistics. But what she found was that as the executive load goes up, the more structure you have to provide, the more planning and strategy, um, the impulsive aggressor gets worse and worse and worse. So it's not language per se. They're bad at language, but it's because they're planning and strategies and they're all, they're all misset. But if you think about that, if, you, if I'm talking to you and you're getting all agitated, uh, 
you're not thinking what you really ought to do. You're not planning what the, the consequence of your behavior is. That's the explosive outburst. You're not really worried about the consequence. Now look at the premeditated. Uh, we just published a paper this year in uh, personality individual differences on a, a group of premeditated individuals compared to some non-aggressors. Uh, same neuropsych battery give the impulsive aggressors, not a single difference, not a single clinical sign, nothing. Clean. They do fine on everything. Like they do above the fine on a lot of them. Okay. As far as the neuropsychology goes. Okay. Now we go to the personality. We have a, kind of an interesting quandary here. The impulsive aggressive individual, as you would expect, is impulsive. Everything they do is impulsive. They speak out of turn. They spend too much money. They say things inappropriately. They, you know, they're just they're impulsive. You all know what impulsive people are like. Just because you're impulsive doesn't mean you're going to be impulsive aggressive, and I'll talk about that also. Uh, and that's a, that's a good question, though, because the, the theories have to somehow separate. You know, I know lots of people that are impulsive, but they're not violent. Uh, and then also they're all very agitated and irritable. You know, Emil Kakera and Ernie Barrett, just to name a couple, have suggested that people are explosively violent or impulsively aggressive because they have some odd mix of anger, hostility, and impulsivity, or as Kakara says, it's irritable impulsiveness. It's its own kind of personality thing. So they, they don't have enough control when they're angry, you know, so they lose it. Uh, what it really is is irritability. They're agitated. They're, they're kind of, they, they feel like they're all wound up inside all the time, and they don't have a lot of impulse control. So you, so your husband comes home, and you didn't have dinner ready. And I had a patient like that, and that ended in a six-hour seat to the SWAT team. After he beat the hell out of her, burned all her clothes, destroyed the inside of the house, by that time the neighbors had called somebody, so when the police showed up, it kind of switched, it lost its kind of impulsive aspect, now he barricaded himself up in the house and held the SWAT team off for six hours. So here he is with me, because he was in prison. What happened? She should have had dinner ready. I mean, he said that with all sincerity. And you know what? He meant it. He didn't, I go, well, did she ever have dinner not ready before? Oh, sure. I had a bad day at work that day. He was, he lost control. He really lost control. He realized once he barricaded himself up in the house that he had, that it was over. He had lost, he was coming down at that point. He ultimately gave himself up after he tried to think through what was going to happen. But he lost control. Okay, he had never planned on doing that. He really, in his mind, he was triggered because she didn't have dinner ready. He really saw that as a legitimate trigger for what happened. Okay? Now, you look at the premeditated person. They're impulsive also, and this becomes a little bit of a tricky thing. Pe you know, psychopaths, if you want to use that term, this, these people aren't all psychopaths, but psychopaths, you know, psychopathy, they tend to be very impulsive. That's, in fact, that's one of the criteria on the hair. You can be impulsive. You can, you can be very, very much conscious and planning of certain types of behaviors, yet be impulsive in a personality sense. So don't get those mixed up. It's a little bit different. But they, they have, they're very impulsive when you give them impulsivity measures and look at things like impulse control. Um, and they're also very angry and hostile, which both of the measures of anger and hostility also really assess agitation and irritability. So it looks like they have the same personality profile when you kind of look at them. Uh, because a lot of times uh, people that are impulsive come out high on anger, hostility, because really it asks you things like, I feel wound up inside, or I'm a hothead, or, you know, things like that. Or I don't, you know what, I don't get over things easily. You know, things like that, which a lot of times are really measures of irritability. So what you find with the impulsive and the premeditated, impulsive aggressive and the premeditated aggressive individual is they show virtually the same personality profile. Now, what's the difference? The difference is this is impulse control, and these guys ha don't have it, and the other guys do. So you're, you're ticked off. You're angry. You're hostile. You have this kind of hostility in, to, in you that's building up, and you have full control over your, your, person, your, your behavior. Well, it's possible, given certain social influences, environmental influences, you may develop the use of that as a tool in the way you interact. Well, here you are, you're the same way, but you have no control over your behavior because you have 
an impulse control problem. You just say things and do things and you're a mess. Well, now you're explosively aggressive, okay? Now the thing is, is you know, it's kind of which one of those is a little more scary. Um, the, the thing is, is the impulsive aggressive guy is scary in the sense a lot of times, particularly if it's a female, because a lot of times they're underestimated. Because you look at the person and they may be very mild mannered and you can know them for quite some time and never see their violence. But when it happens, it's excessive and extreme. One of the ways that you know a killing is, is impulsive is because it's an overkill. You know, I stabbed her 500 times. At what point was she dead? Probably 10 or so in, but you just kept doing it. You know, so you're killing a dead body. It's overkill. It's a, it's a rage. It's lost control. The premeditated individual, their violence is excessive also, but it's quick. And you may not see it. They, they also commit many fewer aggressive acts because they, they don't want to get caught. They use it to their advantage. You, know, you don't see a lot of guys coming in and they're committing a premeditated act every day of violence. They, they commit a few a year or a few every so many years. The impulsive aggressive guy, I've had guys as many as, they've had as many as 20 or 30 outbursts a week of physical violence. You know, they at least have one a day. I mean, our minimal criteria is that you had two in the month before. You know, these guys so exceed that that it's, you know, they, they remember, they can't control it, so it's happening all the time. Whereas the premeditated has full control and they're using it to their advantage. So, neuropsychologically, we see clear problems with impulse control and the impulsive, we see nothing with the premeditated. Now, that's not to say that there might not be something there, just in the test we've given, we can't find anything. I'm going to show you some physiological data in a minute that's going to show the same thing. Personality-wise, they're messed up. Both of them are, um, which is why you would expect them to have some personality pathology, personality disorder. Um, and in the paper we just published, we suggest what I just told you, and that is both have this underlying anger, hostility, but one can control and one can't. Now, looking at this, this is a little bit of physiological data. I want to just explain this for a minute and... Um, you know, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more later. This is what's called a P300. Uh, it's an, ev an event-related potential, an ERP. Um, just to, I'll just go ahead and explain the paradigm now, and then I, it's really hard to see. There's another group in there, but it's hard to see. Um, in an ERP, EEG is kind of spontaneous, ongoing brain activity. I can put electrodes on your head and just kind of watch your brain do whatever. And an ERP, what I do is I have you perform a task. And every time you have to, in this instance, make a decision, I time lock the little sweep of EEG that I take off to that decision process. So in this instance, the person is listening for a high tone that's mixed into a whole lot of low tone. So it's, the high tone is very low probability, and they have to watch for it, and then they count them. Okay? So what happens is the P300, it's called a P300 because in physiology, positive is down. It's positive wave, and it happens about 300 milliseconds after the stimulus occurs. And what it measures, and there's been a lot of you know, theory on these higher cognitive processing and stuff. What I like to say it measures is this. It's kind of cognitive efficiency. Because the larger it is, that means the more resource that you're allocating to make that decision. And the later it is, that means it took you longer to evaluate the stimulus. So it should be right around 300, and it should be fairly large for the low probability stimuli. Because what's happening is it's like low tone, low tone, low tone, low tone, low tone, high tone, low tone, high tone, low tone, low tone, low tone. You gotta, you're kind of primed and waiting for it. So when it happens, you allocate a lot of resource to, to make the correct decision. You kind of habituate to the other ones, okay? So what, what you, what one of the most consistent findings in the literature in aggression is that in virtually any psychopathology, schizophrenia, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, you name it, it's got a low P300. It's too small. Okay? So, with the exception of psychopathy, psychopathy has a too big of a P300, but I, I'm not, that was never replicated, so I don't know if that's real or not. But, um, what we find, that white line right there, that's the impulsive aggressor. And indeed, we've done it more than once. We've used auditory, we've used visual, we've used novel stimuli. Anything you can imagine, they always have a low P300, which suggests, just like their neuropsych, 
that they're not allocating enough resource to the decision making that they're doing. They're not planning well. You see what I'm saying? Their, their brain is not fully processing what's going on. Okay, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that a little bit more later in the context of arousal because we have some data on that. Now, that makes sense with the neuropsych. Now, if we look right here, there's a magenta line in there, and that's like the worst color I can ever use, but it's right there. That's the secondary aggressors. That's my group of murderers, not guilty, where it's insanity. They all kill somebody, but they're all paranoid schizophrenic. Well, one of the classic signs of schizophrenia in general is that they have a low P300, but sure enough, look, they have a P300. In fact, their P300 is just slightly bigger than the impulsive aggressors. There's not a difference there, but they have a low P300. Okay, again, suggests some kind of cognitive processing problem. And, you, and no one would argue that a schizophrenic has problems processing. I mean, that makes sense. Okay, now, the yellow line, that's a premeditated. That's a perfectly normal P300, perfectly normal. Uh, if I laid a, uh, the controls in there, it would lay right on top of that, actually. This is what a medical student's P300 looks like. This is what a normal college student's P300 looks like. This is what a psychologist's P300 looks like. It's not violent, if you can find one. So, uh, you know, it's perfectly normal. There's nothing wrong with it. It's neuropsych's normal. At least in this instance, the P300 is normal. I'm going to show you some, clini some clinical trial data in a few minutes. Interesting. Remember, personality's out of whack. But as far as the measures that we have found to be, cons and I'm going to show you a lot of data on this a little bit later, but the, the, the information that we found to be consistently different in the impulsive aggressors and to change with treatment is perfectly normal in the premeditated. Okay. Now, you might say, well, as I have said, there must be another pathway that's biological. But I would also say, why could there not be a type of aggression that was biological and a type of aggression that was learned or social? And so, um, because clearly there are environmental influences on violence. There are environmental influences on both of these. I would just say that one has a higher load for bio and one probably has a higher load for social or environmental. I mean, I would say that both of these have some biological component and both of them have social. It's just how much of each. Because I think since we're biological beings, it's impossible, for, you know, when I say you're impulsive, there's a biological aspect to that. Uh, there's a learned aspect, but there's a biological aspect too. So I think it has to do with load. Now that, that also will speak to treatment, okay? And that's not to say, and this is something I'll talk about a lot tomorrow when I talk about placebo effects, that's not to say that just because you have a biological loaded type of aggression that the only thing that could help you is a pill um, and that therapy is useless, or just the other way around. Um, what it is saying is that you certainly wouldn't want to approach a, a type of aggression that has a heavy biological load without taking into account that maybe some pharmacotherapy might be useful, that type of thing. So, and I'll talk about that much more tomorrow when I, when I show you some of the astounding placebo effects that we've gotten um, in these guys. All right, what I'd like to do now, um, is show you a really bad quality video, but uh, there's a I have a little bit of a video, and then, then we're gonna in this, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about this gentleman and a few other cases, and then we're probably gonna take a little bit of a break, and then I'll come back and talk about kind of the biological aspect and some of the treatment stuff. Uh, let me just kind of preface this video. Uh, most of these guys don't like to be like people know that they're violent, you know. So uh, you know, I have lots of audio tapes, but I you know, the, as far as video tapes go. Uh, what happened was uh, the news media got interested in what we were doing and they wanted to do a story on us and they asked if one of our patients would be on television and talk about the success of the medication trials that we've done. Um, and one of them did volunteer. His name is Arthur Jones and you're going to see him here. Now let me just put Arthur Jones in kind of context here. This, and what this is is a little snippet from, from ABC News. And it's, you know, I taped it myself. So you got like some like friends right before and then it starts and it's up. So um, the um, Arthur Jones uh, is a guy who works at our convention center. He's an audio visual guy. Okay, he sets up the audio visual things. Um, the problem is, is that Arthur Jones gets in fights with the conventioneers. He throws things at them and hits the wall and breaks equipment and throws amplifiers on the floor because he is impulsively violent. Okay, and he has been all his life. That's another thing. All the day of the people I show you today, they've been this way their entire life. Okay? We don't take people that say, well, I was fine until I was 19 and then I started. 
all their life. They can tell you about explosive outbursts when they were children. Um, so Arthur Jones was sent to me probably one of the most unique ways is that his boss called me and said, would I see him because he was going, she was going to fire him if he did not get some help. Okay. Uh, she's in this video also very briefly. I thought that was at least nice that she gave the guy a chance. Okay. Um, after you see this, I'll also tell you a little bit more about him. As far as where he falls on a continuum of violence, he is mainly a throw things, break things kind of guy. Okay. Now he does fight people because we have another guy in the study that he got in a fight with one time in a bar. And I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But he, you know, this is our continuum. Remember, everybody's physically violent. He is at the low end, but just up a little bit. He throws things, breaks things, and he does get in a few physical fights. He's never killed anyone, and his violence is not all physical attack. It's mainly throw things, okay? Um, but you'll see from the video, he does have a, a significant effect from the medication. The other thing I'd like you to ignore is my big ugly mug on there and the really kind of bad job that the uh, reporter does in trying to, trying to uh, like turn 10 years of research into a soundbite with a motorboat, okay? So uh, the, uh, but I think that's kind of interesting in its own right. So he was a nice guy, the guy who uh, interviewed us. All right. But I thought this would kind of give you a feel for uh, what some of these guys are like. Now, if this works, I'll be shot. And Heather Mills. Oh, you ET. I was watching ET. That's a nice girl, you know. And ABC 26's Tom Bagwell shows us a doctor at UNO is breaking new ground to stop broken lives. It's a lot of moving. Uh, Arthur Jones spends most of his day putting out fires. Part of the job. And trying to control an inferno that rages inside his head. If I have to do it, I'm going to have to come all the way back to the shop. Jones works in the audio department at the New Orleans Convention Center. You have to be able to make changes in a very timely fashion because things are in a constant state of flux. I've been uh, at R06 and R07 and we've got to do a reset in here. We just need to make it happen. This is exactly what we're talking about. The people running this week's convention want a new lectern and two more microphones. Uh. Last minute changes used to drive Jones mad. If he has something in his hand, he'll throw it. This would be across the room, or he'll break it. Uh, I'd have broken these pens and had ink all over my hands for the rest of the day. He'll yell and scream, he'll slam a door. No problem. But sometimes, the anger isn't directed at objects. People's lives are destroyed. Dr. Matthew Stanford is the chairman okay. of the psychology department at UNO. Stanford says anger is a normal emotion. Everybody gets upset. What isn't normal in human society is for you to get angry and to become physically violent or uh, with a person. Two. Ten. Eight. Sixteen. Two. Through a series of tests Two. involving numbers, Sixteen. letters, and light, Stanford is identifying people he calls impulsive aggressive. What we're talking about are your neighbors and your friends and your co-workers who are violent on a daily basis that you may or may not know about. It. Here's an easy way to understand it. Pretend like your brain is the engine on this boat. While the normal brain cruises at about 20 miles per hour. In the aggressive, impulsive person, it drops down to about 10 miles per hour. But when the aggressive, impulsive person gets angry, it's 10 to 40. Anger is well beyond the provocation, and they simply cannot control it. But there is hope and there is help for people who have problems with aggression. It is now 12.55. The session starts in five minutes, and we haven't even checked the mic yet. The stress is still there, but now the aggression is gone. These pills, Dilantin, the same drug used to treat seizures, keep Jones and others calm under pressure. We're going to have mics on both podiums? Yes, we are. We are? Oh, mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. But, uh-oh. No light bulb. One more extra trip. Under the medication, I've realized I don't have time to yell. I need to get doing my job. And 
It's helping me keep my job. Testing one, two. The guests are coming in. All the mics are hot. The sound is good. And it's showtime. With a smile, Tom Bagwell, ABC 26 News. And for more information Mr. about Jones anger, anger, you can call the at anger this control point, clinic. I would say two years zero, five. out of the study, He's still maintained on Dilantin, and uh, actually till, still doing very, very well. Um, like I said, he's a little bit of what, you know, just like I told him, he's a little bit of a low-level aggressor for us in comparison to some of the others. But it was very effective for him. He, uh, you know, what they will describe to you, and I'm going to talk about several different anticonvulsants, but he just happened to be on Dilantin. What they'll describe to you is it gives them a moment to think about what they're going to do before they do it. So it, it kind of cuts their impulsiveness back in a sense. They, their anger does go down, but I don't think that the medications make their anger down, go down. I think just the fact that they're being reinforced more by the people around them. Because I'm also going to show you data that their depression goes down, their anxiety goes down, a lot of things go down. But a lot of things go down on the placebo also. So you've got to kind of tease that out. I will also tell you that the, the drug effects are greater and much beyond the placebo effects. Um, and right now we're getting somewhere between, uh, I'd say, 60 to 70 percent efficiency. Uh, about 60 to 70 percent of the men, closer to 70, that come into the study are showing a significant benefit from the medication. So um, all of that I'm going to show you as we go through and look at some of this. So um, let me kind of begin by discussing uh, psychophysiology and then we'll probably take a little bit of a break um, after I describe maybe the first paradigm. Now, um, the, um, I guess the question is, is there something going on in their head? You know, this is actually kind of funny, I thought, but uh, the guy's missiles or one side of his brain's attacking the other. So, you know, what is it? Is there something, in the, is there something going on? Is there something we can actually see and find? And then, it's one thing to find a difference and say, okay, well, their whatever wave is off. It's another thing to find a difference and then give them a medication, see their behavior change, and see that marker, quote unquote, that you found change back to normal. Okay? Because at that point, then you're starting to get into the idea of, well, maybe you know, this is a marker. You know, it's, it's, you know, a lot of things, you know, a lot of things are wrong with people who have schizophrenia. Okay? But when you treat their schizophrenia and you, you cut their symptoms back, a lot of those still same things are still there. Okay? So the usefulness of that as a marker, something that would be able to identify somebody for a particular treatment, is usually not all that good. And in psychiatry, unfortunately, that's what a lot of, you know, people that have major mental illness or something like that, they have a lot of problems. And when you treat their symptoms and, they, and you deem them to be somewhat better, a lot of those things don't go away. So what we're looking for is we're looking for something that's different and then changes with their behavior. Okay, does that make sense? So most of the data I'm going to show you from here on out is with impulsive aggression, a little bit with premeditated because the problem is we don't have a treatment for premeditated aggression. Um, you know, long-term incarceration, I guess, you know, I, there is, there, we don't have a treatment. You know, you can put them in all kinds of insight-oriented therapy and cognitive behavior therapy and whatever you want to put them in. The, the, the fact is, they usually manipulate the situation and they're a nightmare. Um, they don't have a problem. And I mean, that's not to be funny. Well, yeah, I mean, you can, you can look at that, and the thing is, is that that's really not clinical aggression, though, when we're saying, so, yeah, you're right, you can, you can train someone to kill someone, and they can be premeditated, and move on. but the, the thing is, at that point, is, you, know, you look at the soldier, he doesn't have the personal, underlying personality problems that this premeditated aggressor does, and he was committing, in essence, doing a job, and so that's why, at the beginning, when I defined aggression, I said, most of the aggression literature that exists has tried to use some type of definition that runs from the guy who yelled at his mom to global conflict and they try to get that all in one definition and it doesn't do a lot. I mean you're right, if I'm in a war and I kill somebody that is clear premeditated violence but that's different than if I am, you know, I decide to kill my wife 
which I would never do, but if I, you know, if I was going to kill her and I planned that out and I did that, chances are you could probably say something about my personality pathology like we see with these guys as opposed So I, I do understand the, the, and another thing a lot of times people will ask is, uh, you know, what about environmental influences, which I mentioned so often. There are clear environmental influences on all of these, but what we're looking for is at this point we're focused on the impulsive aggressor and looking for those markers, I'll kill myself here, those markers that will tell us we're getting a positive treatment. What we're probably going to turn around and do now, what we've just done is submitted a, uh, a grant to look at the children of premeditated and impulsive aggressors. So we bring the father in, we're doing most of this in males, bring the father in, he's premeditatively violent, assess all his children and see if they show something that would suggest them to either be premeditated or impulsive, or is it just some kind of mess? Yeah. Uh, what happens when someone is really angry at something that just really is, is ugly, and they do it, and then they just Well, so you say that, that the provocation was, that it was okay? So that's a, actually the question you ask is a question that one of my students asks me almost on a daily basis is that she feels, and I disagree with her, she feels that there are appropriate moments of violence. Okay, now I think that there is self defense, clearly, and we're not talking about that. You're not talking about that. You're not talking about me attacking you and you fighting back. You're talking about me pushing you to a point of anger that which that perhaps someone has deemed it a maybe you or someone have deemed it appropriate for you to respond physically, okay? And I would say that that there is, if I anger you without harming you in a physical sense, that at least in the context of clinical psychology, psychiatry, and the law, you have no justification for being physically violent to me. And all the people I'm talking about are physically violent. That's why we moved away from verbal aggression or passive aggression or some type of relational aggression. So what I do is I undermine your relationship with your husband or I sabotage your work. You see, and those, those were clearly aggressive. But again, those people don't typically show up at your office and say, my life's been ruined because I sabotaged my neighbor's marriage. You know, I mean, they may. They may show up and need some therapy. But it's a different kind of aggression that we're talking about. So the, I, I, yeah, we've, uh, I mean, the thing is clearly, particularly in the animal literature, as I mentioned, the amygdala stands out far and above because it obviously is involved in fear and anger and a lot of different kind of basic emotions. If indeed you could talk about anger, maybe talk about aggression in an animal. The, the, and in Antonio Damasio's work, you know, he has a few patients that have amygdala lesions and they do show some emotional processing problems. The problem is, is that people who are violent typically don't show problems in their amygdala. Now that's not to say they don't have functional deficits that we can't see yet. Um, and I'm not, right, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to specify where a lot of these dysfunctions are. What I'm going to, su I'm going to suggest an arousal modulating problem to you in a moment that's, that's maybe brainstem oriented, but I would tell you that that clearly is going to affect everything up and above. So if you have a problem modulating your arousal and the systems in your brain are unaffected, well, you know, you have a lot of problems, but most of those problems don't bother me. It just bothers me when you attack me.